Welcome everybody to Austin also for me. I'm from Germany, so I'm, the weather is not my responsibility. It's really all Jim's fault. Um, and it was really nice yesterday evening. I don't know why tomorrow and Friday is going to be horrible. But I wanted to do in the next maybe half an hour or so, um, give a little, talk a little bit about our take on end-to-end -end data science. That's kind of a term that's floating around. A lot of, almost everybody out there, every AI company out there, all the 4,000 companies that claim they do AI, also claim they're doing end-to-end -end data science and they're the only ones who do that. So I figured it's worth maybe diving a bit into that one and looking into what end-to-end -end data science actually means in real life. And then, of course, also presenting a bit our thoughts on how we believe NIME software fits into the end-to-end -end data science cycle. And then, obviously, I cannot have a talk on data science without mentioning the A word, which in this case is automation. I will not say artificial intelligence at all through the entire talk. Be warned. If you want to hear my take on that, I'm an old guy by now. I've done AI 25 years ago when we were doing neural networks at Intel. So I have a, I have a lot of deja vus when it comes about these promises, how AI will change the world. Um, and then I'll just briefly talk about a few of the highlights, my very personal highlights for 2019, what happened in nine, and then give talk a bit about logistics, a few minor little changes on the agenda for the fall summit. Um, a lot of people, when they start talking about AI, I'm um, AI, yeah, now I did say AI, damn it. When they talk about, <laughs> can we, Haley, can you edit the video later? Just replace that with data science, data science, data science. When people talk about end-to-end -end data science, it's often, they're really only looking at the usual four stages where you talk about all, lots about data ingestion, all of the data wrangling, model it, visualize it, and then sometimes people even mention deployment. Somehow you need to do something, create a report, or put the model out there, right? And even us, a couple of years ago, when we started to do this little tradition with the magnets, the fridge magnets, the first set of four fridge magnets were these four, read, transform, analyze, deploy. Now, if you attend a course, many here attended a course, you get the specialized magnets, so these by now are collector items. And I remember Rosaria going to an event, I think it was a starter in, in London, and she, they were passing out these magnets, and she was tweeting about it and said, it's really funny, everybody wants analyze, maybe even read and transform, nobody wants deploy. Right? So we got stuck with a lot of deploy magnets. It's actually not even... All of, that, all of that is just methods, but if you really think about it, there's more to it, right? Once I have the model, a lot of people think deployment is, there's a model, there's a report, and that's it, done. But there's a lot more to it when you really see data science as something that affects your business in an ongoing fashion, right? You need something to manage what's happening, because usually the models that you're generating, or even the reports that you're generating, you want to generate them again and again. The data that you're looking at is changing. The models that you could be applying to that data are changing. So you need to somehow manage that, monitor what's going on with your model. Is the quality still good enough? Automatically retrain, deploy new models. And that's still not quite it, because then we have the models somewhere there. Everybody can use them, manage them, update them. But we're still not actually making any value out of that. We're not creating value. So somehow enabling consumption of those models, right? Making sure the people that actually create value out of those models or out of these reports can use them in a regular way um, is one thing. And ideally, you'd be able to have those people that are finally looking at the results and making business decisions be able to say, you know, I think we're looking not quite at the right data. Or maybe this isn't quite the trend I'm interested in. I'm in interested in something slightly different. So you actually want those people that make, create the value out of it, able to optimize the entire process. Right? So it really needs to be much more of a, a cycle. And that, to us, is what we call end-to-end -end data science. So if somebody else claims to do end-to-end -end data science and says, sure, we can do deployment, ask them what that really means. Is it just deployment means you're creating a model and then good luck? Or is it really putting that model into a state where you can regularly use it, update, update it, and make it part of your business processes? So it's really two phases. We kind of cut it in the middle and say the first part is, is sort of the data science core job, right? creating data science. And the second part is really about productionizing it, making, it, making sure it actually becomes part of your, your business operations. And Nime Software very nicely fits underneath, otherwise we wouldn't have created the graph that way. Um, <laughs> Nime Analytics Platform, the open source piece down here, allows people to create data science, create workflows, really, that's what it boils down to. And the Nime Server, our commercial complement 
to the analytics platform is then the piece that allows you to take that and put that in production. Make sure it gets executed regularly, gets updated. You have ways, means, mechanisms to deploy it to real people, to the end users. So what I wanted to do now is just sort of put, look at these four phases in a sense and just briefly describe how NIME is addressing that and what we have done in the last year or so and what we are currently working on to make that even better. The first part is gathering and wrangling. That's something NIME has always been very good at, but we never really talked much about it because for us it was sort of if you want to do data mining, machine learning, obviously you need to have the data in shape. So the wrangling is just a necessity. But NIME is actually extremely good at that. We have a lot of connectors, lots of transformation nodes. We even have a dedicated data wrangler course now. I don't know how many here attended that one. We're mostly just talking about getting the data in shape that you can run an analysis or create some sort of a report. We, a couple of years ago, when there was this huge big data hype, which reminds me of today's AI hype, but anyway, um, it was all about suddenly, well, we're going to dump the data into Hadoop and then we'll figure it out afterwards, right? So we added a lot of connectivity mechanisms, nodes to that, so you can connect to a big data cluster, and you can also run Spark, your nine workflow can control what happens on that big data cluster, right? It's still, it's kind of interesting. Two, three years ago, a lot of when we were, when we were filling out RFPs and people were asking us what NIME software can, what NIME software can do. Are you watching videos while I'm talking about, unbelievable. He is responsible for our partners, by the way. <laughs> what did I want to say? I want to say, a couple of years ago, big data was a requirement. Everybody said, can I do big data? And we said, sure, it can do big data. But now we look at what people actually use three years later. Some people do have that. They have the big data infrastructures. They're using the nine nodes. But it's actually not that many. So often it's just this being able to check the box. Some of the things that's popping up now more and more on the gathering and wrangling is that a lot of people have data spread out over clouds, hybrid cloud systems, a little bit of data sitting locally, some have it all in the cloud. So we're now working on and releasing also in December a lot easier, nicer ways of, I should use this to point, easier, nicer ways to access cloud storage, right? So the way this will work very easily, let's see if this works. It doesn't because my thing is somewhere else. Click on here, I think. Still doesn't work. Okay, I'm going to just point. <laughs> Why the hell? This is super high tech stuff. Amazing if it works. Good. Um, so, the way we're going to do this is that the Excel reader, the file reader, a lot of these other reader nodes that used to just be the sort of the beginning of the workflow, you can now have a connector to some other file system precede that node. It's an optional way, you don't have to do that. If you don't have it, you see only the local file system. But once you do that, you connect the Azure Blob Store connection, or you put, take the Amazon authentication in front of the node, suddenly you can also access and browse that file system. So the very same workflow that runs locally, just by changing the connector node to the beginning, or adding a connector node to the beginning of that, you can make that, um, why does that not work? You can make that um, read in and access cloud, cloud resources. And just to show that we, we are totally agnostic to who that is and where, where, the, where your cloud is sitting. You can do that with Microsoft, with Google, with Amazon, and other cloud repositories. And mix and match that also with your local files or with your big data, with your big data cluster. On the modeling and visualization, same story. We have had, we've always added lots of native implementations for gradient booster trees, decision trees, what's floating out there, what's currently the hype. And of course, we cannot keep up with all of the new algorithms that are popping up left and right. So what we're doing instead is we're adding integrations around a lot of that stuff. There's, I mean, two prominent ones are H2O. It's a super high performant machine learning library from the company based in Mountain View, good partners of ours. XGBoost, wonderful gradient boosted, uh, boosted uh, learning library that we're integrating. And of course, the same thing we're also doing out around other applica more application specific data type specific integrations. For instance, for life science extensions, sequences, molecules, molecular structures, that type of stuff, text processing, image, time series analysis. And then of course, if you really want to reach out to something that's still available as an R or a Python library, we also have R Python integrations for that purpose. Some, some of the things we have been recently working on, 
is, I mean, we started deep learning integrations with deep learning for Java maybe something like three years ago. Deep learning for Java isn't quite that prominent anymore, so we have now TensorFlow and Keras integrations, and we recently added also Onyx, the Onyx format, so you can process that as well. Mix and match that any way you want. And one of the things that we are currently adding lots of things around is these cloud cognitive services. Right? Things for the famous one is upload your image and it will detect if there's a cat in there. More useful is probably doing things like translating languages, tagging them, doing some of those things that, that Amazon could do extremely well because they have tons of material, tons of text to actually train those services. And that's sort of the standard stuff that we've always been working on, right? Adding new integrations for data types, for data formats, for types of services, machine learning AI types of services. The deployment is something we've always done as well, but we never really put it sort of in this flow. So the, and in, ultimately, what you really can do is you can do two things, right? You create some interesting model or an interesting overview of your data, and you can deploy that to humans or you can deploy it in some way or other to machines, which essentially means you're probably deploying it to some other application. For instance, to a Tableau that does great visualization, but the analytics in Tableau aren't that great, but then you reach out to Nine, for instance. So we can do that as analytics applications, which is essentially our web portal. So it builds a web application. You don't see the workflow anymore, but you build the web application with just the right level of detail for your end user. Or you build a web service that can be called from pretty much anywhere else. In a sense, the way this looks like, one of the things we have worked on in the recent years made sure that this web portal, this way of taking a workflow and converting it, it's actually you're using the workflow to build this analytics application, is a lot more modular and easier to run. So we'll see a lot more about that on tomorrow morning in Johnny's and Paolo's session when they talk about building these types of guided analytics applications using nine workflows. And the other thing we have worked on quite a bit more on is distributed pinning execution, being able to actually deploy workflows and run them on a cluster, and be able to choose certain types of cluster nodes that have specific requirements for that, that fulfill specific requirements for that workflow. And we can also now much easier create these web services by packaging them as a service. And ultimately, what this really looks like is something like that. This, now it works, cool. So essentially, you have some, some Nine workflow, just a standard Nine workflow that, that does some cool stuff that you want to deploy as a, as a web service. And then what you do is you just add container input and container output nodes that define the interface. You upload that to the Nine server, and it's there as a REST service. No extra code required, nothing else required. You just upload it, and there it is. And of course, the name container then makes you wonder and say, I wonder if at some point in time, you can not only use that through the Nine server as a web service, but also put that inside a container. And Jason, where is Jason, is working hard on that back there. So if you have questions around that one, that will soon show up as well. The other part from deploying manages the management part. And that's something we have talked about a lot already, right? I mean, Phil gave various talks on the model factory, I think it was two years ago. Last year, Greg was talking about the monster model factory for chemistry type stuff. Ultimately, what it is, is the ability to take some sort of a workflow that creates a model, or maybe even thousands of workflows that create models, like what Greg was talking about last time, and automatically rerun them, retrain the models whenever it's needed, or on a schedule, or when the performance degrades too much, different ways of doing that. And there's a really nice white paper about the Nine Model Factory. You can find it here, find it on our website. And it comes with workflows that actually do run. So you can use that as a blueprint, say, okay, if I had to retrain lots of models, how would I do that? So it's a very good starting point to do this. And all of this really centers around being able to call a workflow from a workflow. Because that's ultimately what happens, right? The model factory is a master workflow that calls out to thousands of other workflows or parameterized versions of workflows that allow this retraining and this model monitoring and this alerting. That's one thing, that one aspect of um, management and the other part of management is of course being able to version, making sure things are backwards compatible two years later, stuff still works and produces the same results, documenting what you're doing, compliance, best practices, all of those things. And to me, this is all part of visual workflows, right? A visual workflow tells you what it's doing, being able to upload that to the server automatically, create snapshots, do versioning on these workflows, um, 
documenting what it's doing. A best practice, we see a lot of people in larger organizations use our NIME server to share lots of example workflows where they just say, if you want to analyze this type of an essay, if you want to run this kind of a customer segmentation, here's an example workflow. You only need to maybe change a little bit on the input, a little bit on how you want to see the results, and that's it. You don't need to start from scratch. So this ability to use a, as a workflow as blueprint is pretty powerful here as well. On the last side, consume and optimize becomes harder and harder to really display beautiful NIME workflows for this one. But the interesting part here is it's still a NIME workflow, right? When we finally have the workflow that does what we want to do and we want to deploy it to others and we want to make sure they can consume it, we don't have to recode it in some other tool, right? We're still talking about NIME workflows. I upload the NIME workflow to the server and it either turns into a nice, more or less pretty. This is one of the prettier versions. My workflows usually look a lot uglier. And it turns into a nice web-based application that has either just one button to press and do whatever you're supposed to do, or it can be very, very interactive, and we'll see more of that tomorrow. Or you uploaded it with these container nodes, and it turns instantly into a, into a web service. So there's no, you have to hand this over to another group, and they will then do some magic, and then it shows up on the other end as an application or as a web service. You, the data scientist who designs this one, or the group, the team of data scientists, they upload it, and it's available within a second. And the other part is, of course, the optimization. What does that mean, optimizing it? I can, once I start using this application, I'm, of course, going to say, this is nice, but, right? Classic users, very annoying. So they're going to come up with some new ideas what they would really like to see. So you can now go back and have to recode it, and then you pass it on to someone else who has to build a new deployment, and three weeks later, you may have something where you say, that's not what I wanted, right? So you start again. In this particular case, I'd call that agile data science, just to have that buzzword in here as well. Um, it's really all one workflow. If the end user, the business analyst, looks at this, the outcome at the web portal application and says, it would be nice if I could adjust this one here too or change this one here too, then the data scientist can say, OK, I'll add this piece to the workflow. I change the workflow here. I upload it again. And 20 minutes later, you actually have that change, and you have it in production. That's one part of optimization. The other part of optimization is more machine learning, or AI, or whatever you want to call that, where it's really about building workflows that incorporate, or building data science applications that incorporate user feedback and improve the model that way. So the classic example could be something where you present pictures of objects, and then you ask the user, is this a cat or a dog? Right? The user selects a few, maybe 10 dogs, 15 cats. And then the system optimizes the model, retrains the model, and says, OK, here's a couple more pictures. If you can help me tell if this is, a, this is a cat or a dog, I can improve my model a little further. And after that, I go out and classify 20 million pictures. Right? You can do that for all sorts of other things as well. And we have support for that. This is a little bit more machine learning hardcore stuff. We have active learning loops in NIME. So you can build this as part of the NIME workflow, where it builds a model, it gathers user feedback, retrains the model and does that until performance is good enough or some other criterion, but until you get bored and say, good enough, leave me alone with those stupid cats. So we have both of these ways in there, right? Part of the optimization is being able to go back to the beginning, rebuild the application and deploy it very quickly, and the other part is actually make that part of your data science application, this learning aspect. Good. So that's sort of the breadth from gathering over model visualization, deployment management, all the way to cons consumption. And the interesting part here is it's still all one workflow. It's the same workflow that you use to build the model. You build the scoring workflow. You deploy that to the server. You don't have some sort of a tool breach in the middle where you have to need someone else, and then it turns into some Excel sheet that contains some rules and stuff. We've actually seen that in real life. Very scary. Automation. Do I really have to have data scientists in my organization that do all of that stuff and build all of these things from scratch? So what I call, that's actually like all good ideas, it's also stolen from some other presentation. But somebody else, and I stole that from him, called first generation automation is what's currently on the market, right? You have all of these AutoML, driverless thingy, whatever thingies. And essentially what they're doing is they're going to tell you, here's a black box. And I'm going to put all of the stuff into the black box. And then I'm going to assume you have reasonably clean data. Because actually, to be really honest, getting totally raw data, automating the cleaning and the transformation and the feature engineering completely, 
I have serious doubts that that will ever really work, right? If you don't put a little bit of expert knowledge into what kind of data and which shape we will operate on, the model is going to do pretty interesting but pretty random stuff. So we start with some reasonably clean data. Then this tool that you bought will give you some pre-canned interaction so you can twist some knobs. Usually it looks very fancy. And they say, okay, this is cool. Half of the stuff you don't really know what you're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. And the other half of the stuff you say, that's not really what I, would, what I want to control. But anyway, and then it spits out a model. It says, good luck, have fun with that, right? There's no deployment mechanism, no retraining mechanism, no optimization. If you really want to go back and say, oh, this isn't what I wanted at all, the model really doesn't do what it's supposed to do, you just rerun this entire process, right? That's why the black box doesn't really cover everything. A lot of these black boxes ignore at least parts of the gathering and wrangling and definitely ignore all of this piece. So what we are suggesting, second generation automation is more about automate some pieces and guide through some other pieces. And here's one, it's just an example where you say, well, you know, the gathering and the wrangling, it's easy data, we can automate that, doesn't really matter, we do a bit of automated feature engineering, we're happy with this one. Modeling visualization, not really core of our business, we don't really understand much about it, we don't want to understand much about it, so we'll take this piece that does the model optimization, it creates the visualizations. But you know, the deployment, that's where we want to have a little bit control, over it, what we deploy, how often we deploy, we want to double check, we want to sanity check that the model actually works before it goes into production. Right, and the consumer optimization, same story. That could be one setup where you have that, where you start with really reading data, whatever you have, where you have customized interactions, really depends to, well, what are we looking here? I should present this in a way that it actually makes sense to the, to the people using it, and then outcomes, not just a model and then good luck with the model, but it's really deployed in whatever infrastructure you have, right? Could be interactive use, some continuous deployment, whatever you need, right? And maybe there's some alert system in place that once the model doesn't work well enough or you're detecting some outliers, you actually do go back to the deployment management and you're pointed to the console and you can do something there again. That's one version of that. Could be different, right? Different organization. Deployment and all of this con consumption stuff can be automated, not really a big problem. But on the model side, we really know what we're doing and we're believing we can, be, we, we believe we can really make a difference if we twist the model selection a little bit, right? So maybe that's the part where you want to have customized interactions. So in a nutshell, what it's really is, it's about the mixing and matching, what you automate, where you need interactions, and maybe at some point, you really want to dive into the nitty gritty details and build a workflow here because that's something where your expertise really is and this is where you can create a difference, right? So to me, it's kind of automated pieces, some guided interaction where you say, you know, they don't, at this point, the end user doesn't really need to understand all of these pieces, but here, this is really where we can make a difference. This is the part where we optimize custom data science. So if you look at that, I'm a computer scientist by training. What computer scientists do, their only, only job in the world is to abstract, right? We are using it machine code, then we invented assembler, then we invented higher level programming languages, then we invented Excel, whatever, but it's all abstraction away from the, the details of what's really happening inside the machine. This is exactly the same type of idea, right? You have custom data science is really knowing what you're doing. I'm going to use a gradient boosted tree here and not a deep learning network. Here, regression is fine. This type of pre-processing on the data makes a lot of sense. For other pieces, it's where you say, you know, I don't really need the end user to control of this. I can use a component, but I want to have a bit of an interaction. And the other part is something where you say, we can automate the hell out of this one. Really doesn't matter. So abstracting data science, to me, if you look at that, it's really about, you have languages, right? We have a few that are more um, specialized for data science type applications, like R, very good example. Python used to be a general purpose programming language, but has now become de facto standard for data science as well. JavaScript for some of the visualizations. You don't do that in NIME, you don't have to do that in NIME, but if you want to, you can reach out to R, to Python, to JavaScript, to Java, to lots of these coding languages, and reach out to this type of weird, interesting technology that you want to try if that really gives you an edge. One level over that one, and to me, that's the way data science programming should be done. It's a visual workflow, right? It gives you exactly access to the types of functionality at the right level of granularity that you need for data science. Then over that, you have the services, right? I can deploy what I have as a service. It becomes something encapsulated. 
And even nicer if I could build a nice application and deploy that directly as an application. So this is sort of this abstraction stack that we've been using for the past couple of years. And I was always, it was always bugging me a little bit because there was, miss, there was some piece missing in the middle. Because somewhere between these workflows and the services, is, it's, you're really jumping from the hardcore data scientist building a workflow to the user consuming it. There's something missing in the middle. And the way we are filling that gap is by using what we call components. Right? And that's something you'll hear that over and over again in the NIME sessions over the next day and a half. We'll be talking a lot about how these components can be used for various types of things. Components can be, we have components, and Christian will show you the hub, another nice little feature how to find these components for automated or for guided versions. So one is just black box does it, and you just have to trust how it does it. Or there are some that have additional interactions as well. So we have automated and guided versions of machine learning, of feature selection, of interpretation, of model management, deployment. All of these things exist, right? So you can use those and say, you know, for the data prep stuff, we'll use the automated component, good enough for our purposes. Then I'm going to build my own custom workflow for the modeling because I really know what I'm doing and I want to optimize the hell out of that one. And for deployment, we're going to use one of the guided components. You mix and match that any way you want. Components are. That just gives you a little bit of a feeling what kind of stuff is already available and that's continuously growing. Things like removing seasonality on time series analysis. The people that attended the time series course saw that. It's one of these components that pre-packages something which we can already use. And then the, whereas the automated machine learning is here, automated visualization, document pre-processing. So some are for specific data types, some are for specific types of tasks, some are just putting together in a box boring stuff that you don't really need to care about. The other nice thing about components is you can use them to share stuff with others, right? You can say, this is the way we're looking at customer data in our organization. Here's a component that does that. If you start to have more other different types of data, we can integrate that and make that part of this co component, and everybody starts using this new way of looking at data, right? You could also use that to hide some of the information, say, this is the way to look at anonymized customer data, and only a few people really get to see the full customer data. Standardizing data access, defining corporate reporting schemes. This is how we want to see stuff, right? There's a component for cohort analysis, right? That we always want to look, when we look at cohort analysis, so this is the way how we present it. We have things for, the other nice part is, this is not something that you get from someone else and it's a black box, those things are, I'd like to be able to claim those things are gray on purpose. They're gray because we couldn't pick up a better color, but in retrospective, it's actually a very good idea. Because it's not a black box. It's a box that you can open if you want to and take a look inside. Maybe you just want to know what the hell's going on. Or you want to say, this is nice, but the model automation thingy, which should really, really use three and a half dimensional decision trees, because I strongly believe that's the best technique out there. Right? So you add it and create your own little component that now also looks at that type of model. And of course, best practices, compliance, all things that you can encode in these components. Which goes back to when do you do what? When do you use automated components? When do you do it yourself? When do you reach out to code? When do you want a little bit more interaction? And the way I'd like to look at that is this gray bar. No, it's here. It's not here. Very funny. Um, so there's standardization. There's now an increasing amount of standard data science services that you can just rent, right? I don't know, 10 cents a prediction. And in many cases for language translation, if that's not core of your business, it's good enough for that, right? It's something where others can do it better and they probably also have way more data to really train a good translation model. You don't want to get into that business. If it's your business, sure, you want to get into that one. But for those types of things, having standard tool services, reach using these nine nodes that reach out to some of these cognitive services, great, why not? For some of the other things where it's something where you do need a customized solution because your business is a little bit different or your data looks a little bit different, but it's not something where you have the in-house domain expertise. Maybe you don't even need it. And the, it's not really business critical that you get the last percent out of this thingy anyway. For that one, automating it or alternatively you just outsource it to someone else is of course also an, an option. And that's something where essentially you kind of trust that that model that falls out of there, or the data model, if it's the data ingestion thingy, really fits, and it fits for a while, because that's not something you want to redo on a daily basis. It's going to either become very cumbersome to run through the automation process all the time, or your consultant is going to charge you a lot of money. 
And then there's the piece in the middle, which I called custom data science. That's the part where really optimizing this piece is critical to what you're trying to do, right? Prediction performance, really the last percent does change your bottom line by a million dollars, right? Then maybe you should get into picking out the models manually and optimizing this a little bit. So they're building custom sites makes a lot of sense. And maybe being able to try out new technologies as here. There's a new version of strange deep learning, whatever networks I want to try if that gives us an edge. In many cases you try it and you realize, okay, it doesn't give me an edge, but at least you know. And then the last part is something, the polite way of putting that is essentially saying data science innovation deeply embedded in your business. You really want to make sure you're using bleeding edge technology. In reality, it's usually making sure your geeks are happy because they want to play with stuff. They want to try out the things that were just published and came out of some university group. And then you want to be able to mix your custom data science also with workflows, also with code, reach out to the Python stuff. In many cases, you'll probably won't put that in production. And in the cases where we have seen people putting code into production, it gets into all sorts of nasty little problems, but different problem. But you want to be able to reach this, and then you can combine those different ways of um, data science. One last comment before I start talking a little bit more about the summit. I'm going to make that last comment without picture, apparently. No, oh, works fine. Was that the screen timer? Is that a subtle hint? <laughs> so to me, data science and production, that's where the agile comes from. There's a reason why I called it agile data science, because if you look at what you're trying to do, what you, what you want to do in real data science and production, you want to be able to say, okay, we are going to define some initial requirements. We're never, ever going to get it right from the beginning, right? And we're not going to be right in a year down the road anyway, because a year down the road, we're going to have slightly different questions, different data sources, different tools that we want to explore. So we need to be able to turn around. So we'll, we'll start with something where I say, this is the goal, this is the data, right? Classic mistake is to say, here's the data. That's the question I'm trying to answer. Wrong order, often goes wrong. Okay, so you start with the goal and then you say, this is the data I need to answer that kind of a question. And then you do the usual things, right? You develop an initial analytic application or service, you embed it in your organization, you deploy it to the business user, you talk to them, is this what you wanted? They tell you, no, this is not at all what we wanted, you need to change this all. You gather the feedback, you adjust, you expand the requirements, right? And then you go in and you say, okay, if you really want to be able to adjust these knobs as well, we'll add a little bit more interaction. Maybe we don't fully automate this piece, but we allow you to play with a few of these parameters. We expand some of the automation pieces here and there, or we add other data sources. Maybe if the geeks want to, we try out a few other fancy algorithms just to make sure they don't really give us the edge either. And then you go back, and you want to do this in very short cycles. This is not new at all, right? This has been software development cycle, agile software development. Just like software development isn't a waterfall model anymore, data science will never be a waterfall model either. So this cycle, you see that again, we have seen this, we talked about this for 20 years, crisp data science cycle. So we have done this, but the, the point is what do you need? The problem is a lot of people don't have the tools to actually do that, right? It takes forever to get the model in deployment. It, this, it's never a cycle, right? It's a very, very clumsy cycle. So what you need is a real end-to-end -end environment, and that's my point. You need one platform. You don't need five different tools that have to somehow talk to each other. You want one platform with this entire cycle that does support these different levels of abstraction. So you don't want one platform that requires you to code everything. You also don't want platform that automates everything. You want somebody to say, I want to automate this one. I want to code here. I want to do custom data science here, right? And I think in the next day and a half, we'll hopefully show you many examples of where Naim does this very well. With this one, two slides on a few highlights, or at least things that I liked. Um, Nine continues to grow, um, even though a lot of people, especially in the US, don't even know we exist, but we brought a couple of new leaders on board that will help us change that. Tillman Eberle here in front uh, is taking over marketing at Nine, and Albert, whereas Albert is our head of revenue. I don't know, he must be, he's waving over here. Um, he's taking over all of our customer care organization, the revenue gen generating part of the business. Um, Lindsay just joined in the US. Are you sure about the 10, Jim? I thought we were a dozen people already. I wanted to make, crack a joke about the dirty dozen. That doesn't work. Anyway, it's too late anyway because Lindsay just joined. 
But we already signed up Steven, who is here in the room somewhere, is joining the US team over here. And Yip, who is down here, is going to join our Zurich team, helping us with the internal IT. So we keep growing, we lose count a little bit. But just recently, our internal email alias for all of the people working with NIME, for NIME somehow, uh, reached the 100 mark. The community, huge aspect for NIME growth as well. We now have, it's hard to count open source users, right? I could talk about billions of downloads, Okay, it's not billions, but millions. Uh, whatever, some large number that doesn't really mean anything, but what we do see is we have about a quarter million active users that are, have given us their contact information and they seem to be interested enough that they haven't unsubscribed. Um, we have, that's an interesting metric because now in the last one or two years, Wazai has done a lot of work with the evangelism team on adding more educational materials. So we have regular online classes that you can sign up for, but we have also an online course that you can take just at your own pace, lots of other training material. We have about 50,000 people that have touched one of these training resources one way or the other. And it's also nice to see that we now have over 100 meetup groups spread out over the world. Brazil is very active, lots of places very extremely active running local communities. That's one thing. Gardner, I cannot do one of these openings with Gardner. Six years in a row straight now, we're up there in the leader quadrant. Not going to say anything because it's taped. I have an opinion. Ask me, how, how did Jason yesterday say, meet me at the bar? <laughs> this is my personal highlight. There's a lot of cool stuff that happened at Nine. We have a lot of cool people working on a lot of cool stuff. I could talk for hours about that. But the one thing that I find really extremely interesting is the Nine Hub. And I'm not going to say much more about that because Christian is going to show that in 20 minutes or so. But the idea is really to have one central place where you can go to. It's literally hub.nime.com. You can find workflows, you can find components, you can find notes, you can drag notes that you found into your, into your work, into your workbench, into the workflow directly, the component, same story, you can open workflows directly from there. So this is really one way of not only us sharing workflows with the community, like with our example server, but everybody can upload workflows to the hub, right? And you'll see some of this in, in real life in a second, well, in a couple of minutes. So much for that one. Many more highlights. You'll see some of those in the What's New sessions that we have spread out over the next day and a half or outside at the demo station. Um, and just talk to the Nimers. The Nimers are the ones with the fully orange name badges besides Tillman for some odd reason didn't get that. But now you know who he is, so <laughs> he can't hide anymore. OK, as for today's program, tiny few little comments. We learned, we got feedback last year that people Last year, we had everybody in the room for the opening and the what's new and cooking session for about three hours straight after serving them tons of coffee before they got into the room. That didn't work out so great. So we are going to be learning. We can learn from experience sometimes. Uh, so we're going to spread, up, uh, spread the what's new session now over a couple of presentations over the next day and a half. So we're going to start in the afternoon with the server and then the analytics platform, and then on tomorrow morning, Johnny and Paolo are going to talk a lot more about the web portal. Um, unfortunately, Laura from Horizon Media couldn't make it, but Robert Burkhardt offered to substitute for her, so don't be surprised if Laura doesn't quite look like a Laura. Um, that's that for the first part of the day. We'll then have, we'll conclude today as is tradition with the Phil Show. For those of you who don't know what that means, You'll never for, will forget who Phil is after that. Um, and then we'll have dinner at Bangers, which I still think is a very odd name for a place. But anyway, what is Bangers? So I was Googling around a little bit, and this is probably the best, very German way of looking at Bangers. It's a beer garden. It has to be good. And the other thing, if you're more of a systems guy, they have the largest draft system in the states of Texas, 200 plus beers and drafts. So it should be fun. We can try, we are a little bit over 200, so we ought to be able to make sure that each beer gets drunk at least once. <laughs> there will be buses outside, bad weather again. Jim is to be blamed for the bad weather. Um, if everything goes smoothly, talk to Christiane in particular at the reception desk who has organized this together with Lindsay. This is, I think, all for today. Don't miss the bus, and then we'll just have regular buses going back, so you should be able to grab a bus every 15 minutes whenever you had your 200 different beers and are ready to go to bed. Um, tomorrow, we'll start at 9 with the what's new and cooking in the 9 web portal. Should be very interesting. Paolo is going to put together one of these workflows with the different components live. 
Um, and then we had one little problem with Jeff's talk from the Air Force. It sounded extremely interesting. And as I unfortunately also know, bureaucracy sometimes gets the better of you. He just did not get permission to actually talk. <laughs> So we'll hopefully we'll have another 12 months to figure that out and he can present next year. But he's back there. Grab him over coffee. He volunteered to tell everybody, well, you're not going to say anything, but you can talk to him anyway. <laughs> that, that's, that's all we can say. That's all we can promise. So we're going to have, we'll simply skip that talk and we'll just start a little bit later and that gives us a bit more time for Dean Abbott's keynote and kind of takes a bit of the stress out of, of the morning agenda. And then the other thing we learned is uh, last year, a lot of people started disappearing after lunch. So we figured if that's what happens, then maybe we should just stop with lunch this year and that's what we're go going to do. There's going to be a lunch break at one and then that kind of sort of officially ends the summit. With that one, one last remark. We have a table outside, we call it the nine champions. For some odd reason, I'm not quite sure I make the connection to mushrooms, but never mind. And those aren't even champions up there in the corner. But the idea is if you are willing to help us spread the word, I think that's really the message. If you have a story to tell or you like to share a blog post or you're interested in writing together an innovation note and you have some cool content, be it a nice workflow, a cool use case, a great business case, just talk to somebody. Usually Phil is going to be there or Haley. Talk to people at the champion table and we'll just take a few notes and then we know how to, how to reach you afterwards and we'll reach out to you and we'll try to help as much as possible. But the content obviously needs to come from you, it would be cool. We have a couple of innovation notes already on the web that came from the Spring Summit earlier this year. And that's a nice way of, sometimes it's just interesting to hear what you guys are doing with our software. Good, with that one, I'll hand over to Rosaria who is going to talk more about evangelism community activities. Thank you very much. <laughs>